Welcome back aviation enthusiasts and uh, fellow aircraft builders. This is going to be about the fly cutter. It goes by different names. Mainly you'll hear them called uh, fly cutters or circle cutters. Uh, sometimes people actually refer to these as hole saws. However, a hole saw, at least here in North America, generally looks like this. This is more or less the hole saw. And actually, the, in this case, it's uh, general tools. It's actually labeled a circle cutter. So this thing can cut uh, anywhere from one and three quarter inch diameter up to, all the way up to eight inches diameter. And it, you can actually cheat a little bit and go further than that if you want to. It has some markings on it. These don't ever pay attention to any of these things. These are not uh, precise enough to actually make dimensions that you need. But the way this works, it fits in a drill press. There's a fairly heavy duty arbor or a shaft that goes up into there and you want to get that as tight up against the chuck as you possibly can. This is a very unbalanced tool. The wider the circle that you're trying to cut, the more uh, it'll sway back and forth and wobble like this, uh, the more that it will do that. So throughout the airplane you have a bunch of holes you have to make. Here's a uh, wing, wing rib. This is the root rib uh, for the main wing. And you have to cut a lot of lightening holes. That's lightening, not lightning lightening holes so that it makes it lighter uh, that then have to be flanged or flared so that um, it reduces weight and then you also get passed through for wiring and things like that. So there's a number of sizes of these that you have to drill uh, out of flat stock and, uh, and then flare later on. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. I found that the hole saw method where I'm using a, an actual uh, a typical hole saw with teeth on it just produces a much too ragged hole for what I'm looking for in anything that's an affordable tool. Uh, you can get some precision made tools that, that do more than that, but I think this circle cutter here was like 15 or $20. And the way that it works is you have a Allen head screw, this one's metric, here that allows you to change the diameter of the hole this way and what I typically do is take a measurement right from the very center of the tool out to this edge here and then play with it a little bit cutting some test patterns on a sacrificial piece to determine if I've got the hole uh, exactly right and like I said if you pay attention to the measurements that are already on this little this little arm or arbor here uh, you'll be off a little ways so it's really close but not 100% it's always best to make sure and what I've actually done is actually once I've got the measurement correct I scribe a line right at the joint here so that I can repeat that measurement uh, anytime I need to make some adjustments and there's only four different sizes of holes you have to cut for the CH750. So just a few notes about using this tool. Um, the way the uh, tool functions you can see that the this is the cutting bit and this is a one quarter inch pilot bit. All right, so with the bevel pointing up and outward, that would be if I was going to be cutting a circle with a uh, 90 degree uh, side to it. And then if I wanted to rotate it back to the original position here, this is to cut a hole to the diameter uh, or to the radius or diameter to the outside edge of the cutting bit here. Not a crucial, crucial issue when you're cutting super thin sheet metal, but even on a sheet of say 25,000, which the ribs are made out of, you really don't wanna bevel the cut edge that's remaining on the stock. So for this type of a cut here, you want this surface of the hole to be sharp, square, uh, with the cut of the metal or with the uh, metal that's uh, left, the piece of the stock itself. So you would use the bevel up and inward to cut the hole and then if I needed to cut a circle of aluminum or wood or whatever I would rotate the bit 90 degrees and get the bevel going the other way so that the stuff that it was being cut out of was being beveled rather than uh, what was actually being cut. So the uh, next few segments of this video were shot at different times with a different camera uh, so the quality varies but it's all pretty good information that I want to share with you. This can be a very dangerous tool to use so make sure you follow my safety tips in the next few segments of the video. Thanks. Alright, so when you set up your fly cutter to cut your uh, lightning holes, a lot of times you'll have a tooling hole right here, or a pilot hole. I recommend that if you don't already have a tooling hole present with your rib material, uh, that you do drill a slightly undersized pilot hole. But um, in this purpose I'm doing the rear rib and I've got a pilot hole already dr drilled with a one quarter inch uh, bit. The cutter, the our fly cutter is already set for 95 millimeters. So the way to locate this, if you're working by yourself, as I often am, is to go ahead and bring your bring your uh, bit down 
and thread it through the hole. And, it, and sometimes with your sacrificial block underneath, it's easier just to actually drill a quick scoring line with the fly cutter so you get a, a pilot hole started and then lock your table down. So I started like that and then I set my clamping blocks or at least one clamping block where I need it to go while I'm holding the uh, rib down in place and then I set my clamping block. After that, once this side is done and clamped in position, I'll double check and make sure nothing is moved. That slides right in there and then I'll place the other block and go ahead and set the other clamp. And again, before I drill, we make sure that that hasn't moved at all, and sure enough, it's exactly where it needs to be. So that's the easy way to do it when you're working by yourself. If you have a partner, it's a lot easier. They can just kind of pinch it down to the table while you set your clamps in place. But uh, often we're working late hours in the shop by yourself or in the garage by ourselves at night, so that's the easy way i found to do it by yourself. It may seem self-explanatory, but again, just little tips and tricks that I've learned along the way to make things easier for us all. Fly cutter is not a particularly user-friendly tool to use. It uh, can be very dangerous. It has a tendency to catch the metal when it cuts or as it cuts and uh, if you don't take the proper precautions it can really hurt you. Uh, aluminum is a very sharp metal particularly when it's freshly cut and this thing can send pieces flying. It can cut you uh, with the shards of uh, the discs that this thing cuts out when I'm cutting the circles out. These things are very sharp so you need to take proper precautions when you're using one of these fly cutters. So, so I have a sacrificial block underneath here. It's just some MDF and I actually just have simply have that duct taped to my drill press bed mount here because uh, when you clamp everything together that'll stay clamped down anyway. So I just have it duct taped there so it doesn't slide off and that gives me maximum uh, room to clamp anywhere that I need to on the platform. So what I've done is put some uh, standoff blocks up here to clear my flanges. So I've got uh, wood, metal, wood, and then the the uh, platform to drill with. You're not going to cut very deep. This thing only uh, needs to cut through 25 thousandths aluminum. So the cutter over here, which I've sharpened a couple of times on a whetstone, makes fairly quick work of it, but you'll probably see it's going to maybe potentially have a tendency to grab. You absolutely have to use clamps on this. You should never drill with a fly cutter by hand unless it's something that you absolutely just can't fit into a drill press and I think in the uh, Zenith 750 um, and maybe the other Zenith designs the only instance where that ends up becoming a um, a proposition for you is when you're putting the fuel sending units in your fuel tanks and I'm not to that part yet I haven't built the fuel tanks yet but I may actually just go ahead and pre-cut those before I weld them up but at any rate that's the Zenith instructions are to fly cut your fuel sending tanks our fuel sending unit holes on the wing tanks and the the tanks come fully welded and fully assembled if you buy the kit so but you have to go very slow with a hand drill and in fact on my drill press I have to have it set at the very lowest possible speed and in my case the lowest speed I can get is 540 rpm although the fly cutter itself only recommends 500 uh, I just simply can't slow it down anymore unless I start altering my drill press. So 540 works okay, you just got to go very slow and you want to use very minimal pressure on the handle when you when you start the cut, when it gets when it makes contact with the metal, you need very very little pressure, consistent low pressure all the way through the cut until it until it cuts free. If you do too aggressively, the bit will get cut, it can break, it can rip the part, it can actually tear the metal in the part or it can rip the part out of the clamps. If you try to hold this by hand, I guarantee you won't be able to hang on to it and uh, it's going to rip out of your hand and it could very seriously injure you. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut this hole and be sure that your standoff blocks when you're clamping are, are well clear of your cutting. Remember this goes all the way around in a circle so you need to make sure that your cutting blocks are clear of the perimeter of the circle and anything else that might obstruct that. So let's give it a shot and see what happens. Always, always remember to wear your safety glasses. Uh, I probably should be wearing a full face shield on this, but uh, uh, safety glasses are going to protect my eyes. I've been hitting the eyes so many times uh, in this project already, from the router to the drill press, a anything you can imagine, cutting metal. So always, always wear safety glasses when you're working with metal. So we're going to cut with a very, very consistent pressure. It's now in the pilot hole. As soon as it makes contact, I'm going to go very gently and very lightly. You can hear it. Now it's starting to cut. It's going to start squealing. One side will usually break free first. 
and that see it's there it caught and we don't it it happens it's just the way it is back it off as quickly as you can try to go a little slower As soon as it breaks free, the part, uh, the hole you cut starts to spin and you're done. So the reason that this uh, caught on the side of the platform here is because there's a slight bow to the material. It's not because my platform is, is off. Uh, that's squared up to the chuck. I've already checked that many times over the years that I've had this drill press. It's simply because there is a slight bow to the material and doesn't lay completely flat against the sacrificial block underneath. So it'll happen as soon as it does, back it off, get it unstuck and you should be fine. If it hangs out there for too long, you're going to start to burn up the belts in your in your drill press. Uh, if it has an auto shut off, it might it might trip that uh, auto shut off. Uh, but if it keeps trying to put bully through that metal, uh, what it'll do is it'll t catch and tear and kink and do all kinds of nasty things. So once you take your clamps off, you'll have a uh, um, not a jagged hole as long as you've got a nice sharp bit on your on your fly cutter you won't have a jagged hole to worry about um, but you will need to deburr it so take it out very gently try not to scrape across the metal bits get those out of there and you'll have a nice round perfectly round hole and it's actually very smooth even uh, there's a slight burr where it caught and then just a slight burr around the edges I'll go through with my flapper wheel on the inside here I've got a flapper wheel, although this is a 60 grit, I'll use a 240 grit. Just gently on the drill press, go around and uh, deburr it, and I'll do that for every hole. So this rear rib actually requires three holes. I've got a 65 millimeter hole in the back and a 115 in the front, and this was a 95 in the center. My nose ribs also have 115 uh, single hole. So I'm actually going to go ahead and cut all these holes out, and then I'll switch to deburring and deburr all the holes at the same time. And you notice that you lose your tooling holes when you do that. So you do have to form the parts first and then cut your holes depending on the method of uh, forming that you use. You'll lose your tooling holes and that's okay. That's They're, they're gone anyway. So uh, good luck. Be very careful with your fly cutter. Make sure you've got your machine set up properly to the proper RPM that the fly cutter itself says that you should use or at least the lowest possible RPM if it's above that and uh, be sure to wear safety glasses. Gloves are also a good idea. I have these all deburred and clamped down very well and I'm not even holding the part while I'm using it so I'm not too worried about getting cut by not wearing gloves. But gloves are a good idea when you're working with aluminum. All right, real quick, real quick I just wanted to show you one other uh, thing with the uh, fly cutter here. Uh, because you're working with a carbide bit and aluminum, you'll have a tendency, the aluminum is much softer and it heats up quite a bit when you're working on the bit and you actually will end up getting a, a little bit of uh, aluminum stuck to the side of the fly cutter blade uh, from time to time and you'll start to feel when that happens when you cut the holes will start to uh, feel like they're not cutting as quickly they'll look like they're actually carving out a wider channel than you want and that's because there's a lot of excess aluminum getting stuck to the side of the cutter I think you can see it probably best right there that just that little bump out right there below my finger that's just aluminum stuck to the side of the stuck to the side of the bit and you can usually scrape it off with your thumb if you've got a nice smooth blade uh, you can usually scrape most of that off but if not just grab your whetstone um, and a little oil don't use a file because the file will make this blade very um, almost serrated and you don't want it serrated so just grab a whetstone um, you know one for your sharpening knives I think I've got an open L one here and just knock that knock that burr off a little bit sometimes it'll pop right off with your fingernail You just want to knock it off the best you can without uh, without changing the sharpness of the bit. Uh, you can also use a razor blade and scrape it. Usually, it's best to actually pull it right off the pull it right off of here. But since I've got so many more of these to cut, I'm just kind of dressing this dressing that a little bit. But I'm not actually changing the sharpness of the bit. If you feel the bottom of it, there's no burr on it or anything. So I finally just, the aluminum will break free and fall off. So, probably should have done that without my rib on there, but you can see because it was getting <clears throat> more, it was getting dull because of that buildup of aluminum. Now it's got, 
you know, burrs are building up on the on the inside of the cut, and now there's a lot more that has to be deburred on this than there is when you're when you don't have a buildup. So just keep that in mind. Probably every four or five holes that you cut, you'll have to go through and, and take that extra aluminum buildup off of the blade. And uh, that's it. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Thanks for watching.